Okay, so the next talk of the session is by Jaina Chen on cluster editing kernelization based on edge cuts. So uh, this is uh, on the uh, on the on the cluster editing. So let me let me just go quickly. You know. So basically, an informal definition of this problem is say you have a graph, you want to apply a set of edge operations, but I want to this size, the cost of that operations is small. So you then you can convert a graph into a union of disjoint clicks. And also differently you can see, you know, from other things, if you are more general, just you have a set, you have clustering relations, you somehow want to make small modifications to make that into disjoint clock, you know, uh, clusters. Okay, so then uh, I guess this already we heard from previous talks. So this is uh, one that has applications in many areas, in particular in bioinformatics. That's also we also we also looking into like a gene clustering. You can find an application on that. So a formal more formal definition for this particular problem because we actually we look at a, we look at a weighted version of this problem. So what you have is a, suppose you have a you have a weight function. This goes from pairs of vertex to uh, to uh, to an integer. Okay, here we are. We're, we restrict our case to a positive integer numbers so, or infinite. Later, we are going to relax this to real numbers. Okay, and then uh, uh, so you whenever you have a set of pairs. Okay, this vertex pairs. Then you use this operation to mean this. So you put them together that. So that if the pair contains in this, you remove the edge. If there's an edge in, in the graph, you remove that edge. If there's no edge there, you insert the edge. So you can really think about it. this is just a, a collection of edge operations by in, you know, adding, inserting edges and the deleting edges from the graph. And of the, the total um, cost of this, we wanted this to be small because here we already defined this weight function. So you can use that to define the cost of each edge insertion or deletion. Okay, so now we say this is a solution, just like what we, our objective. So if you, know, you do this operation, you get a collection of disjoint union, you, uh, disjoint, <laughs> disjoint clicks. Okay, so now this is a formal definition of this. Say suppose you have a graph also, you are given such a weight function on the pairs of vertex. Okay, and also suppose you are given a parameter now you want to decide you want to, you know, if there is a solution, okay? And for that particular solution, you want to weight it to be small, so bounded by k. So by the way, so now we're not talking about the number of edges here. Uh, we're talking about the number of, you know, just the total weight of this. But remember that because each edge has a weight at least one. Okay, so this is a more general version. Um, we are looking at the kernelization of this problem. Okay, so basically we want to do is that, suppose you have such an instance, you want to construct a, a equivalent instance such that uh, this, the resulting graph here is small. Okay, so and, uh, we call this as a kernel. Um, previous work on this, most of the work on this problem are on the unweighted case. So there's a sequence of uh, results here. So currently you could actually do this uh, for unweighted case, that means each edge operating consists a cost of one. You can do this with a 2K kernel. By 2K, I mean this is the number of verdicts. Okay, and for weighted case, a more general case, as what we know is a recent result present, uh, presented a K square uh, quadratic kernel size for this problem. Uh, so our result, basically, in this talk, we're talking about for this weighted case, we have a 2K kernel, okay? Uh, probably more interesting is the, uh, the approach. Okay, so first, of course, this, this, this approach works for weighted version. And the previous, uh, pre previous techniques, if you look into that, they don't seem to be easily translated into weighted version, for weighted version. And second, actually, the, as the title said, that, uh, so our approach is based on specifically on edge, edge cards. Okay, previous, previous approach, most of them, in particular, those are more recent ones are based on you know, critical clicks. So this is the 
directly related to modular decomposition. Okay, and uh, well, although modular decomposition can be constructed in linear time, actually construction is quite complicated. We actually start also start from that from that approach, and I ask a student, you know, a master student, he spent like a whole semester to implement that. that. That's actually the algorithm. Once you implement that, you find practically it's not very good. That actually motivated us, so we somehow say, well, can we get rid of that without using that? So this the approach presented here, really just we don't need this one. We just go from edge, edge across. Uh, in fact, you find out that you, you really don't need it that, you know, based on, if you use edge cross here, and you find that you could have a much simpler algorithm. So our, this reduction rule, remember we are doing kernels, right? This is a one pass reduction, so you never do this iteration. Like previous work, most of you do, you do, you know, apply one reduction, get it reduced as instance, then you apply another reduction on that. We don't have to do that. Basically, if you give me a graph, I just look at every vertex once, okay? And for each, for each vertex in that one pass you know, reduction, for each vertex, we are only looking for a single case, okay? There's only one case. So that means if the vertex satisfies that case, we apply the rule. If it doesn't satisfy, we ignore that. Okay, so really, eventually, this reduction becomes quite a simple compared to the previous approach to this problem. And also, another thing I want to mention, so really, our reduction doesn't really depend on that K. Okay, so it's, it's, this is a little, you know, kernelization, basically, the K, you, you, know, you can assume K is just the minimum, you know, the optimal solution to this, uh, to this problem. Of course, you can also try, you know, starting from larger k and try smaller and smaller k for doing this one. But this one, you know, you can see this is more like a vertex cover. You can pre-process that and you get a, a size which is at most twice of the optimal. So this is basically like a, a similar style like that. And uh, uh, also, actually, we can use this not just for integer weighted case. We can also do this for real weighted case. Okay, I'm going to explain how we do this later. So we start with something terrible here, okay. Don't worry about that. We're going to probably to remind you something since I some, sometimes I need those things. Some of them are standard, I guess you all know this. So when we look at the E, we say a cut between them. We're talking about the edges between these two sets. Okay, and that we have this has a weight of a cut from a one set to the complement of it. So those three are, are con these two, these three probably are uncommon. So delta we call this the, the uh, deficiency. Basically, that means that if in a vertex you want to make, you know, just add edges in the neighbors of that vertex and make that a click, that's the amount of cost you need to you need to pay because those are the number of edges are missing in that list. Okay. Then we have something we call this stable cost, which later we'll see. This is like a twice of the cost you use to make this neighbor into a complete isolated uh, a click. Okay, so you can see that uh, delta is the one you have to insert this many edges to make it inside like a click. And this gamma, remember gamma here is the cut size. That is the cost you have to use that to separate this neighborhood from the, out, from the other side. Okay, um, so and then we define a one condition, as we said, we, this is really the condition we need for our reduction rule to apply. So if this stable cost is smaller, strictly smaller, than the number of vertex in the neighbor of that vertex. Okay, in that case, we say that vertex is reducible, or you say the neighbor of that vertex is reducible. Okay, also we use omega to, to denote to the optimal solution weight. Anyway, I'm gonna remind you this. Okay, so, so here is basically the, uh, uh, the approach here. I try to go through this, since I have part of that, we can give precise you know, proof here. So really, what it is the observation is this. Suppose you have an S, okay, that is a solution to this graph. Okay, suppose that is already the case. Then that means that if you do this operation, then it becomes you know, a collection, of, a union of disjoint clicks. Then you really find in that graph, actually, every induced subgraph is also a union of, sub, of, union of disjoint clicks. That is basically, basically the idea. 
very simple idea. And if you use this, apply this to edge to edge cards. So you get things like this. For example, you have this result. Okay, this result says if you look at the optimal sol solution weight here, okay, and the other way is that you split that you split this graph into two parts. One is this vertex plus its neighbors, and this is the other part. If you do two optimal solutions here, then the cost of this two wouldn't be larger than that. Okay. The other one is that if you still use this two cost, on the other hand, if you also add the cost of the cards between these two sets, okay, then you get something larger than that, larger than that optimal solution. Very simple to prove, right? So like this one, you can see this. Okay, if you have this, this is a solution. If you remove all those pairs between this set and this set, okay, then the rest of that really make this a click, this a click, this union of clicks. Okay, so in that case, that means they already make two solutions for this. Therefore, if you look at the optimal solution, they wouldn't be larger than that. On the other hand, if you look at this one, what you could do is this. Okay, you can first construct, a, you know, make this set a union of disjoint clicks and make that set a dis, dis, uh, disjoint, union of disjoint clicks. And after that, you remove all edges between these two sets. Sure, then you get a union of disjoint clicks. Okay, so that means this wouldn't be better than the optimal solution. Okay, it's like quite easy to prove that. And also the other lemma also says certain things. Suppose you have an optimal solution here, okay, then if you look at any set, okay, then you also see a result somehow like this. Okay, I could also explain this a little bit. So what you can see here is that, so this is the optimal solution, okay. However, if you if you partition all those, remember, this is this S, okay, this is a collection of vertex pairs, okay. You take those which are within this, uh, within this subset, you see that they still make a union of clicks here, okay. On the other hand, you, if you look at the rest of the edges, okay, you find that they are included in that part, okay. So that gives you this condition here. Uh, this probably is too rough for that, but anyway, so this also holds. But if you look at them, basically we use this edge cuts weight, okay, as a way to operate them. So these are the two uh, results I, we, I just stated in the previous page. I tried to show you how to uh, use this to, to prove certain things, like uh, for example, now we look at this way. So now we suppose we look at this, okay, neighborhood of a vertex. If that is a redu reducible, this is, a re this is to remind you, so what does that mean, reducible? That means the raw of that is not larger, it's strictly smaller than that. Okay, raw of that is a twice of this deficiency, i.e. this is a cost you have to make inside of the neighbor. If this is reducible, you can actually make this, a, this, this set a click because that's entirely contained in a click in the final solution. That means you have to add edge, all ed missing edges in that, okay. So this is actually the proof if you want to go this. So first you take this condition here, you copy them down here. Okay, so this is this, okay. However, if you look at this condition, you find out that this is the way, this number of, this is the cost you want to make it inside of this as a click, okay. So that wouldn't be larger than the optimal way to make this a unit of clicks, okay. So that means this is larger than that. Then from here, if you copy this, copy this down, Okay, then you find out what is that. So this one is a smaller than or equal to delta. Okay, and this one is a two delta, wait, wait, wait. Okay, this row, this is a two delta my, uh, plus gamma. So you arrange them, you get this one. Okay, this is a basically come from that lemma one there. And then uh, uh, you could also have another one say, now suppose you have this one, and it, if by contradiction you assume this is not a, contained in a single click, so that you can write them in a union. Okay, such that X is contained in a single click, Y is the rest of part of that. Okay, then you use the second lemma here. Well, I probably don't want to explain too much, but it looks, you can see that then you can directly get this result. Okay, and from that two results, so now you can see this is a smaller than that, and this is a larger than that. Then you connect them together, you get something like this. So finally, you get this case. Okay, you get this case. Well, let's put it this way. So you get this. Okay, and I try to see this will be x times y is strictly smaller than x plus y. And you find that there's a unique solution. So remember that x and y are both integers. So that has, that has to be this way. 
Okay, then this, then this is strictest less, so this two have to be equal. So that gives you this already. Okay, and by this, you have this one, you rearrange this, you write them, you find out this optimal solution would be equal to this. What is this? Look, this is a way, so you have this vertex V, so you use this gamma to cut this V, okay, N of V, okay, and then you use a delta to fill all those internal edges. I, this is the way to make an N of V a separate click. Okay. After that, you do this for the rest of it. So that means really if you do this way, you make it this N of V a single oscillated click. Okay. So that means that is by this, that means that's also the optimal solution. Okay, that really means that proves that for, there must be an optimal solution that contains that as a single in a single in a single uh, uh, single click in the solution. So, um, so then we have this reduction rule there. So if you have this vertex, okay, which is reducible, i.e., the sets by this condition, then you know that it's entirely contained in some in the solution. What do you do is that in that case, once you identify this, you just add all edges to make this a click, okay, just in, inside the neighbors of that. So that, that basically gives you a rule, okay. Then similarly, I, I'm not going to prove that that's kind of you using this edge across, you can also prove the other cases. For example, again, suppose it's a reducible, okay? And in that case, suppose you have a solution that contains this, in a, entirely contains this in a single click, okay? Then in that case, you can prove that that click contains at the most one more actual vertex, okay? And that vertex must satisfy this condition, i.e., if this is reducible, then that click either is just the N of V, or N of V plus a single vertex. And also for that single vertex, you can easily identify that by that condition. So from this rule, you can already see that. So now once you get this reducible and you already identified this, if any neighbor of this does not satisfy that condition, so that means they satisfy this condition, that means they cannot be in the same click. Okay, so what do you do is that you just delay all those edges and separate those edges from this, from this vertex. Okay, that is also necessary. So another rule here is that, well, actually you can see that, you know, this is, say, you have that click, okay? Really you can see that in the graph, there's at most one vertex, okay? At most one vertex, which says that I this condition. So that means if you apply this rule, you look at it that you, at most you have one vertex that satisfy this condition. So what do you do that, uh, so then in that case, you shrink this into a single vertex, you modify the graph, so now the graph, this, this set becomes a single vertex. You probably change the, the, uh, the edge weight, okay? And you can prove that in that case, you get an equivalent uh, instance. So now to summarize this, so basically, if you find this, okay, this vertex is reducible, I satisfy this condition. Then you just add edges into that to make that a click. Okay, then you just remove edges from outside the vertex that satisfy that condition. And then you have only one vertex left, and for that vertex, you just shrink, you know, contract this, this neighborhood into a single vertex and make equivalent, uh, make equivalent instance. And you can also see that, well, if you, if you can't, if step three is not applicable, then that already becomes an isolated click. Okay, you can remove that from your instance. On the other hand, if that is still the case, then this, this new vertex called as V prime, that is no longer, it's no longer to be reducible. So that really means that if you just look at vertex and neighbors, if that's reducible, you're done. Okay? So, uh, so that's, so that's our main result. Uh, let me also give you a proof for this. So our main result says that if you have, have a graph that has no reducible vertex, remember if there are any re reducible vertex, we just apply the rule to eliminate that. So if there's no re an reducible vertex, then that has, either that has at most a two a k vertex, or there's no solution of weight bounded by k. So this is basically the main results. So proof basically goes like this. Suppose you have an optimal solution. So now what you do is that instead of counting the edge weights, the cost of edge, you evenly split each edge to its two ends, okay? And in that case, so you look at those vertex which are not in that solution. Remember, those vertex are not in the solution, that means 
the, the local structure of those verdicts are not changed. Okay, that means really the neighborhood of the, each of those verdicts must make a click in the final solution. Okay, and for those, for each of those, for each of those verdicts, because the verdicts is not, a, is not a reducible, they must satisfy this condition. That condition really means that for each such a click, the verdicts in average, okay, because this cost is larger than that. That means really for that click, each verdict has a cost at least a half. Okay. On the other hand, well, for each verdict which is already in this S, well, but remember, if that's in S, that means that's, there's one edge operation applied on that. So one edge operation has a cost at least one. So if we split to each verdict, so each verdict has a cost at least one half. So they also have one half. So you added this two, you find out that if you have an optical solution, then in average, every verdict has a cost at least one half. Okay, because of that, then you, you show that then the total cost is at least this much. That means really your graph has the most two K verdicts. Okay, so uh, very quickly now, I, 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 I'm, I'm almost done here. So now you can apply this to one un unweighted case. Well, remember unweighted case is like a, like a more restricted, so you assume the cost on each edge is one. So it seems that you can just assume each edge is, is one, you, you can just go through. That's not really true, okay? You cannot really do that. Remember our step three of the, the rule here, okay? What we said is something like this. Um, you contract a vertex and make a new edge of a weight like this, okay? Then that means really your unweighted case, if you just apply this rule, you get a weighted graph. Okay, so that doesn't directly give you an unweighted in an instance. But anyway, uh, I think we can handle that. We can modify the rule. You still can you know, keep that unweighted case. So that solves this case. Still have a 2K kernel. On the other hand, we, we say we can also extend that to real, real, real weighted case. Okay, for that, well, actually you have more, more gaps. Okay, really there are two, state, two places you have to be careful. One place is this. Okay, we had this, remember, you know, don't have to remember the detail. But anyway, from that inequality, a sequence of inequality here, we directly get this two are equal. One reason is that because both of them are integers. Okay, if they're not integers, you can see this one doesn't imply this, this two should be equal. Okay, so you cannot use that one. Well, that's one thing. So this is no longer true. On the other hand, also step three here. Okay, step three, what the trouble is, okay, now these two weights can be real numbers, not integers. So when you subtract them this way, okay, and then you could create a number which is smaller than one. Okay, by the way, we have to require that all weights are larger or equal to one. Otherwise, it's just, you can see that W whatever hard. Okay, you can always show that. So, but anyway, in this case, simply because you know, this, this will become a number that is smaller than one. So you also have to handle that. And we could also handle that. So I'm not going to give the detail. However, in that case, so if you talk about the real weighted case, really our kernel has to be increased to 3K. We, we, we think in a general version, I think we can do that 2.5K by still working on that. Yeah, but it seems it's a bit difficult to get it, to achieve 2K there, okay? Um, so that's basically my talk. <laughs> Thanks. Yes. Yes, yeah, in particular, if you look at that, that reduction rule, yeah. step three, because you allow more, not just a zero and a one, now you have more flexibility, actually. That's actually quite a, so interesting. It's a, very, it's a very uh, interesting example of working with an annotated problem that's, that's very uh, richly annotated. I want, my question is whether you looked into using a similar approach on other problems. Right, yes. Actually, we, actually we got, we were also, We've been successful in doing this so-called hierarchical clustering stuff. So basically, you want, so you're giving a matrix, you want to make it an arch-metric, arch-metric. Yeah. Uh, it's actually interesting. So that seems more complicated because this is like a hierarchical clustering. You can also do 2K, 
you can also get a kernel today. So this like this edit cards seems uh, it's really powerful as you using these things. Uh, recently, we are also reading those papers by the recent breakthrough on multi cross like all those things. It's kind of amazing, man. Really, it I think. Seems like a, a new technique. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, good question. Well, unfortunately, this is the difference. Since our objective function is on edge costs, yeah, yeah but our kernel is on vertex. Yeah. So that doesn't direct, well, sure, you have something like a square root, probably, yeah. But that doesn't give you a linear. But you're right. I actually I feel a kernelization argument like this, i.e., without a really specific looking at the parameter, that probably is a good way to develop, a, say, approximation algorithms. Yes, but now, at the listen, you, your objective function and your kernel has to match by the same thing. In that case, if this, suppose this were that, then that basically give you a two, you know, approximation ratio two. Unfortunately, they are not on the same thing here, though. What, what is the current record in that direction? I, I'm not aware of that, sorry. Um, I, let's see. Uh, I don't remember. I promise someone that can help for cluster editing. What is the approximation? It's three or something. Uh, well, way that they, I even, not even for, to, know, to remember that one. Yeah, there are a lot of things like that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to give the last talk for today. Um, this is a joint work with uh, Nadja Betzler and Rolf Niedermeyer. Um, we have done this uh, in Jena and recently moved to Berlin. That's why um, here are two universities. Um, yes, this talk will be on the computational social choice problem. Um, this is my outline. Um, I will start with a short introduction into uh, the rank aggregation problem. And then just a few words about partial kernelization. Then I will come to our theoretical results um, uh, here and uh, also to experimental results and finally give a short conclusion. So uh, let us start. Um, what is rank aggregation? In the rank aggregation problem, um, we have given a set of votes and a set of candidates. and. Uh, the uh, votes are preference lists over the candidates. Um, here you can see a short example. Um, we have three candidates and uh, these three votes. And the question is now uh, that uh, we want to aggregate the information into a condensed ranking uh, which represents the opinion of the votes uh, as best as possible. And um, yes. To measure uh, the quality um, of, um, of the consensus, we use uh, um, the candle tau distance. And the candle tau distance is nothing but uh, the number of pairwise inversions between uh, two rankings. Um, here, for this example, uh, you can see for vote one and vote three, the candle tau distance is uh, two because um, a and B are uh, ranked differently. Uh, A and C are also ranked differently. And uh, B and C are in the same order. So, OK. And um, now we can define the Kamini score of a ranking. Um, and that's the uh, sum of uh, candle tower distances between the ranking um, and uh, every vote of the input. And um, a Kamini consensus is uh, a ranking that minimizes the Kamini score. Okay, for one instance, there can be several uh, Kamini consensus. Um, for our uh, example, this is for example uh, the ranking ABC uh, with the Kamini score three. Uh, yes, a very trivial algorithm would be to um, yes to just uh, check the score of each permutation. Um, okay, 
and um, uh, this leads directly to the decision problem um, which is called Kamini score and there yes we have this uh, election as input and one additional uh, integer k and we ask uh, whether there is a ranking um, with Kamini score at most k and um, yes this problem has applications in a ranking of websites um, in the scenario of meta search engines uh, which we can see later on and also for computing the results of sports computations, uh, competitions and uh, uh, when you aggregate uh, information from databases and in voting systems generally. So, um, What is known about the Kamini score problem? Uh, Kamini score is uh, NP complete even uh, if we have uh, four votes and uh, there is much work done on this problem. For example, uh, we know uh, a factor 8 over 5 approximation and randomized even uh, factor 11 over 7 and there's also a, a polynomial time approximation scheme um, but it's uh, really impractical uh, the running time is I, I do not remember exactly but uh, you cannot use this in practice and there's also uh, some work on exact algorithms heuristics branch and bounds and uh, also experiments with this so, and concerning uh, the parameterized uh, complexity, this problem was also uh, investigated for several parameters. This is probably not the complete list, but uh, here I list the uh, most important parameters, um, beginning with the uh, uh, input parameters, I think uh, the number of votes. Um, yes, we uh, have already seen that uh, this is complete for four votes uh, for the number of candidates. Uh, there is a, a dynamic programming algorithm with running time um, two to the n and some polynomial. I think it's uh, um, cubic. Um, and uh, for the parameter, the Kamini score, um, we have also fixed parameter tractability. And uh, also for some structural parameters like the maximum range of uh, candidate position. Um, when you have a candidate in, um, and uh, the range is just uh, the number of, um, of candidates that are uh, between the best and between the uh, worst position. And uh, yes, in this sense we have also um, NP completeness uh, for the average range of candidate positions and uh, the parameter which we want to consider in this work uh, is the average candle tower distance and here uh, fixed parameter tractable is already known and an algorithm of this running time and um, it was also known that there is a partial kernel of this size um, and uh, yes, last but not least, uh, I want to mention that also for the parameter maximum candle tau distance, there is an FPT result. Okay, um, and what is the partial kernel? Um, it's similar like uh, ordinary kernelization. Uh, here we also consider an instance, but um, here um, we say we have an, uh, at least two dimensional NP hard problem um, and uh, these, these are the sizes of the dimensions and yes, the parameter. And we also want to shrink uh, the instance into a smaller instance by uh, polynomial time computable data reduction rules. And uh, yes, we want to achieve a smaller instance that is equivalent. And okay, you do know this, but uh, now we only um, want that the size of one dimension only depends on the parameter, not the size of the whole instance of our new instance, and that is the difference. Um, and for the Kamini score problem, um, here uh, n is the number of votes and m is the number of candidates, and uh, we will, uh, we bounded the number of uh, candidates um, with respect to our parameter. And yes, uh, that really makes sense because Yes, you know, it's NP hard for uh, four votes and there is a fixed parameter tractable algorithm with this running time with respect to the parameter M. Okay, um, here um, we developed uh, data reduction rules 
And uh, the basic idea of the first type of uh, votes was uh, to consider majorities. And here, um, yes, we want to identify pairs which are uh, in the same order according to a specific majority. And then we will uh, take a look at candidates that are only involved in such pairs. Um, I will start with a really uh, rough, um, Yes, with a special case of this, even if we consider the 100% the, uh, ma majority, um, the candidate D um, is always uh, last positioned in each uh, candidate pair. And it's clear that uh, the candidate D uh, will always be the loser in every Kamini consensus. Okay, and now we'll come to a more formal way of this. Um, we say uh, candidate C is non dirty um, according to the three-quarter majority, if it beats uh, each other candidate at, at least three-quarter of the votes, or uh, each other, or, or the other candidate beats the candidate C in three-quarter of the vote, and uh, otherwise we say the candidate C is dirty, and uh, such a pair, a pair that uh, con uh, that is not consistent with this condition is called dirty pair. Okay. Um, and uh, we have shown the following lemma. Um, here we consider a non-dirty candidate and uh, one can show that, uh, yes, if we, we, we take a look at uh, any other candidate and uh, if this can, other candidate um, is beaten by C in three quarter of the vote, then uh, it is also uh, ranked behind C in every Kamini consensus. And uh, if this other candidate uh, beats C in three quarter of the vote, then it's also in front of C in every common consensus. And clearly this leads directly to this reduction rule. Okay, we look, uh, is there a candidate which is non-dirty according to the three quarter majority? And if yes, then we delete this candidate and partition the instance into sub-instances. Um, let's look at the following example here. Um, we have this instance and one can see that each uh, candidate A1, A2, A3 uh, beats the candidate C in three quarter of the votes. And uh, also each candidate B1 and B2 uh, is beaten by C in three quarter of the votes. And that means by definition that uh, our candidate C um, is non dirty and so uh, we will split the instances in this way. So we deleted C and have these two sub-instances. Okay, this idea can also be extended in the case that we want to look for uh, a non-dirty set of candidates instead of non-dirty candidates. And what does this mean? Um, let's modify the example a little bit here. Um, instead of C, we have uh, two uh, candidates um, C1 and C2, and um, yes, uh, C1 beats C2 in half of the votes and vice versa, and that means uh, none of the candidates here is non-dirty, but if we only consider the relations of this set of candidates consisting of C1 and C2, then uh, we can see uh, that uh, what we have seen before also holds um, with res with only with respect to the candidates outside of the set um, the uh, candidates A1, A2, A3 beats um, these candidates in three quarter of the votes and um, here uh, these candidates beats uh, the candidates uh, B1 and B2 two in three quarter of the votes and that means we can also split this instance uh, with the only difference that um, yes for our non-dirty set we also have to construct a sub instance. But um, finally if we solve these instances uh, and have a Kamini consensus, then we can put it together to get the full uh, solution. And uh, yes, I should mention that uh, these sets, these uh, non-dirty sets can be found in polynomial time. I think it's cubic, um, if there is one. Okay, uh, and now we consider the parameter average candle tau distance. And um, our main theorem is uh, that uh, Kamini score instance uh, with average KT distance uh, D uh, can be reduced in polynomial time. And that's, uh, this is done by 
uh, only the first rule that only considers non-dirty candidates. Um, this is even sufficient for this theorem. And uh, it is reduced into an equivalent instance with less than 11 times D candidates. And then parameterized times, that means that Kamini score yields a partial kernel with 11 types D candidates. Um, yes, maybe uh, someone here in the room uh, was wondering why we use three quarter. It sounds a little bit arbitrary, but uh, we could also show that uh, this lemma I introduced before does not hold if we replace three quarter by any smaller value. And this is done by constructing special counter examples where, the, where you can see that the lemma does not hold. Um, okay, but uh, what about other majorities? Um, for, with respect to the uh, greater uh, two third majority, uh, one un already knows that uh, yes, if there are no dirty pairs and no dirty candidates, uh, then um, it's polynomial time solvable. And uh, yes, the number of dirty pairs is also bounded by the average KT distance. And uh, we have a partial quadratic kernel um, with respect to the number of dirty candidates. And it's somehow open if there is also a partial linear kernel with respect to the number of dirty candidates. Um, yes. Um, we only know that it is not possible with uh, the reduction rule introduced before, but maybe there is some other special rule. And um, yeah. Okay. Um, now uh, we also considered another type of data reduction rules, and uh, these rules based uh, on the Condorcet criterion. And uh, this is as follows. Uh, we call the candidate um, Condorcet winner if it beats um, each other candidate in at least half of the votes. And um, yes, uh, it is known that the uh, weak Condorcet winner always takes the first position in at least one of the uh, Kamini consensus. Uh, here I say weak winner because um, a strict uh, or a strong uh, Condorcet winner would be if you replace the uh, uh, greater equals with only greater. And uh, yes, this leads to the rule, uh, okay, if there is a weak Condorcet winner, then um, we delete it because we know it, it can, will be the first in one rule and um, solve the sub-instance of the remaining candidates. And uh, yes, the concept of Condorcet losers are defined analogously and Again, even for this uh, reduction rule, we can also extend this concept to search for uh, winner and loser sets, as you can see in the following example. Uh, we, here we have the same example as before. And if you now take a further look um, at uh, these uh, yellow candidates, then, um, okay, uh, A1, A2, and A3 uh, beats the candidates C1 and C2 in three quarter of the votes. And we also know that C1 and C2 beats uh, B1 and B2 in three quarter of the votes. And that you can, you can show that uh, that also means that the candidates A1, A2, A3 beats B1 and B2 in at least half of the votes. And okay, this fulfills uh, the definition of a Condorcet winner set and uh, Analogously, you can show that uh, the set consisting of B1 and B2 is a Condorcet loser set. Okay, um, and with this idea you have seen here, uh, where we took uh, the, re the remaining uh, candidates gained by the non-dirty rule, one can also show that uh, the, the rule searching for Condorcet sets is at least as effective as the majority-based rules. And again, uh, such sets can be found in polynomial time. So um, now I will come to the experimental part. And uh, here I can also explain why we uh, use all these rules, although we only would need, uh, and with respect to effectiveness, uh, the Condorcet set rule. Um, we implemented the data reduction rules and some algorithms solving Kamini score, for example, a bounded search tree algorithm, this uh, dynamic programming and uh, integer linear programming approach. 
and um, we tested um, our algorithms and the data reduction was on uh, a set of synthetic um, elections, uh, Formula One seasons, where um, the votes are the races and the candidates are the drivers and some winter sports competitions and also web impact elections. Uh, here the candidates are the websites and um, the votes are, um, yes, if you, um, if you uh, start the search in a specific uh, search engine, then, then you rank the websites according to the number of occurrences. And that's why the uh, votes um, correspond to search engines. And uh, yes, and finally the meta search engine, which uh, you will see uh, later on. Um, yes, why do we n use all three rules? Uh, the simple reason is, okay, um, if we look at the effectiveness of the rules, um, oh, let this be the set of instances which can be reduced by the uh, non-dirty candidates rule. And um, this is a set of instances that can be reduced by the uh, condossier candidates rule then clearly uh, the rule searching for non-dirty sets is this set, non-dirty sets. And um, as I said, the rule searching for condossier sets um, is at least as effective as each other rule. And this is the whole universe of elections. Okay, but um, if we look at the running times, um, uh, then we can see that the least effective uh, rule um, is also the fastest to compute. And that's why we try this heuristic combination of data reduction rules where we um, apply first the non-dirty candidates rule. Then if it uh, does not succeed, then uh, we apply the Gondasier candidates rule and then the uh, non-dirty set rule and finally the Gondasier set rule. And what we can see in practice is, uh, here we have uh, three uh, example instances and um, if we only use the Gondasier set al rule alone, uh, we uh, need uh, this running times, and uh, if we use this heuristic combination, then um, the running times goes down. And um, yes, this was always the case for every instance we tried. And um, yes, okay. Uh, and now, uh, maybe someone here wondered what these funny names are, and that you can see on the next slide. Um, here, we finally um, simulated um, the task of meta search engines and we, therefore we used uh, the engines Google, Lycos, MSN Live Search and Yahoo and um, we, we asked for these search terms and took the first thousand hit, hits for each and uh, then we, we cut it out um, websites that only appear in a few of them, such that um, we, the remaining candidates appear in all four rankings. Um, then with this, we got uh, instances of sizes about 100 to 160. And then we applied the data reduction rules. Uh, here you can see in this column the running times. It's uh, only a few seconds for each instance. And this uh, last column uh, is the result of the data reduction. And here, um, each number uh, represents a set of candidates and these green numbers with brackets um, represent a set of candidates where we know, where we also know the positions of the candidates inside. And here these uh, red numbers without brackets, uh, here we only know the positions with respect to the other candidate sets. And Yes, for example, as you can see here for the uh, instance corresponding to the search term architecture, um, 
Yes, um, only a few hard instances uh, survived. And um, yes, it was an instance of size uh, 12 and one of size uh, 17. And for example, with the algorithm, with the dynamic programming algorithm, uh, these two sub-instances could be solved in a few seconds. And uh, that's how we could solve the whole instance. But also some harder instances, uh, we could also find some harder instances where the a set of irreducible uh, candidates uh, was quite um, greater. Uh, yes, uh, the instance with 109 um, candidates we could not solve anymore. But at least even for this instance, we, sh we know the uh, first nine winners and the uh, 13 losers of this instance. And that's maybe also of uh, interest in this case. Okay. Um, what have we learned? Um, we could solve uh, quite large instances um, with more than 100 candidates. And um, we were able to break these instances into sub-instances. Uh, that's not what uh, we proved with this kernelization, because kernelization only means we reduce to one instance and we know the size. But in practice, it can also be the case that we gain several smaller sub-instances which are somehow independent. We can solve these instances independent and uh, then uh, took the solutions together to get the complete solution. And um, in this way, um, parameterized complexity helps us to get a better understanding of the kamini score instances. We uh, could prove um, the effectiveness of data reduction rules and uh, could show that uh, the Kamini score uh, problem uh, becomes easier when the average KT distance goes down, and that's provable. Uh, of course, one expects this, but uh, parameterized complexity was a tool here to prove this. And um, furthermore, we got a um, partial linear kernel which bounds the number of candidates, and this is particularly meaningful uh, because, uh, yes, the Kamini score instance is solvable in two to the number of candidates time, and it's NP-complete for number of votes, which means that there is no big uh, disadvantage um, when we uh, do not uh, bounce the number of votes. Okay, thank you. What do you exactly mean? Um, I mean you commercialize. Commercialize. Hmm. Ah, yeah. Uh, it's hard because um, I think uh, at the moment nobody would pay for solving Kamini score instances. It's, it's somewhat hard to convince people to use this type of, uh, of voting rule because, okay, um, there are several reasons to use Kamini score. You can, you can um, uh, say you want a, sev a set of um, of good attributes that the voting rule should have, and then you can prove Kamini score is the only way you can do this. But uh, most people in practice then say, oh, uh, I don't need these attributes, I use border, and border is easy to compute. And that's, I think that would be a reason. First, one, one has to convince the people that uh, this voting rule is really uh, of particular interest. So. We'll get started. Welcome to this business meeting. Um, that's the agenda for the evening. We'll start with some um, statistics and information on IPEC 2010, what's happening so far. Then we have want to award excellent paper award, and then some announcement about IPEC 2011, and then we will i leave the floor open for any discussions and comments on anything on IPEC you want to talk about. Okay. Um, 
So we had 32 papers. This is a you know, bit low compared to some of the previous years. We'll, we'll come back to that. Um, we accepted 19 papers. Since we were geared for lots of papers, we had lots of program committee members, so we had lots of reviews for every paper. Uh, this is probably one of the very few conferences where we had four reviews, and some of the reviews were as long as the papers themselves. So, so we thank the enthusiastic participation of the PC members towards that. In fact, some papers had even five reviews. Um, so I said, you know, in contrast, the number of submissions was 47 when we started. So as some of you know, IPEC started as an event that was happening every other year. And in um, 2008, we moved, to, moved IPEC to an annual event, um, which was, you know, 2009 event reinforced that our decision was correct because a lot of submissions, 52. But this year it went down. Um, this is something for a discussion later. Um, yeah, so lots of theories about this. We can uh, discuss about this at the last part of the agenda. That's uh, some statistics from EC Chair on the submissions. We had papers from about 20 different countries, and that's sort of the acceptance ratio. You can mull over it. It simply says that if you, for example, want to increase your acceptance rate, you may want to move to Chile or Austria or, or something like that. Taiwan? Okay. No, not Taiwan. OK, so even though the number of submissions was low, but I think we probably had a record number of registrations. I don't know uh, people from the past IPEC can comment on, the, on this number. So we crossed a century. Um, registrations from uh, 15 countries, out of which India accounted for 73 numbers. And I don't know, IMSC probably accounted for 20 or something. Um, right? Is that the number? Okay. Um, okay, so these are some numbers supplied by Mina. Our sponsors, the major sponsor is all of you, um, because most of our income is from the registration, but not all. And uh, this institute has committed to making up any shortfall. And Francis Rosamond has sponsored the Excellent Student Paper Award. Thank you. So for some of you who were here the last couple of days, we had a satellite event, um, a school and parameterized and exact exponential computation that had um, 94 participants. And this was sponsored by Indo-German Max Planck Center for Computer Science. OK, so that is IMPEX, nothing to do with IPEC. OK, so on to the paper award, um, as I said. This is the first time, I mean, this has been uh, proposed several times in the last couple of years, I would think. And this is the first time we've made it happen. Um, so we actually made this, this in the announcement of the call for papers itself. And um, maybe because of this, I, we don't know, we, we, the 25% of submissions to the conference was by students, I mean, authored by all students. So it was a tough competition. And um, there were a lot of discussions, finally, uh, in trying to select the, two, the, the winner for the Excellent Paper Award. Um, we couldn't really break ties, so at the end we decided that it will be shared by these two papers. Um, so now I would request the authors to come and collect this award and Mike to present it. So the first paper is by Jesper Netherlauf and Johan van Rooy, Inclusion Exclusion Branching for Partial Dominating Set and Set Splitting. So.
hand over to you. Grant's giving me instructions on how to present this sort of thing. Let's see. Where are we supposed to be? Does anybody have a camera? I hand this to you first. Oh, no, that's the problem. It's first I shake your hand. Okay. Can you ask to turn the light on? Sorry. Make, can I ask to take the light on? Nice you want the light on? Yeah, to make the nice photographs. Okay. Can, can you make the light on? Are you ready? Congratulations on some really nice work. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> you want us to do that again? Yeah, because I want you to smile. Smile at the camera. Get the camera off. Okay, that's what's mentioned. Hold on. Congratulations. Let's try again, okay? <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. Sorry. Oh my God! Close your eyes. Sorry. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh wait a minute. Oh. Okay. Let them switch positions. Switch places. Ah, okay. What's this one? Is, this one's my name, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the contribution of this paper is a very elegant and basic tool called partial requirements branching rule that everyone in parameterized and exact computation should know. Okay. So something about Jesper, I, I made a typo in the title of your talk as well. So. <laughs> I think you had a lot of typos in your stuff. Okay. <laughs> um, so the next paper um, you shared for the excellent paper award is by Praveen. Please come. So th this is a paper on uh, Petri nets, and again, reading from one of the reviews, it's an underexplored terrain, likely to stimulate further work on two you know, nice application of parameterized complexity for complex concurrent computing situations. And also, it draws attention to the, the parameterized polynomial space, which has not been uh, looked at seriously. So thank you. Miko Flipsick here? Yeah. Okay, so at the, at the workshop in Leiden on kernelization, so come on up. So Socket uh, had a, are you? Yeah, come up here. <laughs> I was just explaining how, the, how this came about. So Socket suggested that we have a, a problem session and like the mathematicians do, offer some small prizes based on what we thought the difficulty and importance of the problem might be. And I, I proposed a moderately difficult problem with a small prize, and it was very rapidly solved. And so congratulations to the three solvers. There was Mikhail Filipsik. The problem was about... But Marcus was first. Oh, Marcus, come up here. Oh, oh. And um, Mark Jones was the third? Yeah. Is Mark yeah. here too? Well, then all three should be up here. No, Mark Sagan is currently in Poland. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, these are the two of the three. Uh, Mikhail Marek and Mark Jones was the third. He made a nice solution to a problem about approximative protrusions in relation to vertex cover. Congratulations. <laughs> Keep up the good work. Thank you. All right. <laughs> No, I'm not sure. 
there. With all the all the other prizes will be published. Yeah, in, I think it's. I already sent it. Just that I have to put the dollars if I if I want to do that or not. It's going to be in the newsletter or something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The next item on the agenda is IPEC 2011. Um, that's going to happen in conjunction with uh, ALGO 2011. And there's a preliminary call for papers. Peter Rosmanet, is he here? Uh, Peter and uh, Daniel Marks will be co-chairing the program committee. Um, this is going to happen in Saarbrücken. Yeah, do you, do you want to add anything to this? Thank you. Yeah, um, this will be, of course, there's a next IPEC next year. I think it will not end so soon. Uh, it will be co-located again with ALGO. As, uh, I think it was co-located with ALGO too in, in Copenhagen, in Zurich, and in Bergen, I guess. So this will be in Saarbrücken, that's in Germany, it's, but it's on the f exactly on the French border. So the food is almost French there. The organization is German. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what? No, it's this way around. <laughs> Yeah, Kurt Mehlhorn will be the general chair of ALGO. There's ESA there and, and lots of other small conferences. Um, yeah, this is the preliminary call of papers, but almost all is on it. There will be an invited talk by Martin Grohe. And the most important date is, of course, it will happen from 7th to 9th of September, so you should know that date. And ALGO itself is from 5th to 9th of September. So please keep your calendar open on these dates and submit some nice papers. Yeah, thank you. So one of the things I noticed is that the proceedings will be after the symposium. Is that, that right? Okay. Okay. So any questions, comments? Okay, so that's all we have and then we open Okay, so now the floor is open for anybody who has any comments on anything. Um, 2012 is still being discussed. There's one school of thought, which is, is that every other year we co-locate with um, ESA and the alternate years it goes around to some international location. But these are some thoughts in, of the steering committee, but we're open for any, any comments or discussion, anybody have anything. Can Sakit, can you take note of it? We can discuss this in the steering committee meeting.
where in 2012? So he, okay, outside Europe. Okay. So. I mean, some his numbers. Every time when we had outside Europe, I think the number went down. So I don't know that it says anything. Um, I mean, this is very small data point, but in Victoria it was 32, and it's 32 here. I mean, I have another theory of why the number went down here, but another theory. Really want to know. Well, as PC chairs, we decided that PC chairs will not submit papers. So, Saket couldn't submit papers, so we lost some 10 papers. <laughs> yeah. Argument about having it. So, Okay, I mean, location is one topic. I think there are lots of proposals. But any other item you want to discuss about? For example, one thing we did this time is to have a school before that. I think a lot of people liked this two-day school. This could be something which in future people could consider. I thought the school was a great idea, and I was very impressed with how active it was and how many participants. It seemed like a really marvelous uh, event to have the school. And I guess I was hoping that we could brainstorm or use the school as a stepping point for figuring out ways to increase the participation opportunities for people sort of broadly. We've been to a lot of different conferences lately. Comsoc has a different model. Um, we were just at a conference in Show Bay that had a lot of poster sessions, and then there were papers which are only for presentations, but not in the proceedings. Um, didn't go well, but we could revive it again. I thought that Comsoc had a very interesting model. So they had a local proceedings, which is an unofficial local proceedings, and. Um, and then they had, they had a, what did they have, a special issue? Or they just had an unofficial local proceedings? Oh, that's right. So they were able to um, attract a lot of papers that would be, were going to be presented at, at very top conferences because it didn't count, so to speak. I'd, I'm wondering if I anybody has any comments about models for these workshops one way or another.
many ways. And then some, somewhere when you try to submit these things somewhere else, then people say, well, but there has been this pipeline abstract somewhere. And that's sort of a publication thing. Yeah, that's a kind of uh, objection to do. The point was that the Comstock reviewers and the program committee didn't count, as explicitly didn't count, previous publication. So you could send work that had, had appeared at AAAI or, or wherever you wanted, and they wouldn't rule it out by saying, oh, it's already previously been published, because they wanted this to be a community meeting. This, this workshop attempt to, to gather the community on parameterized complexity. And what we can uh, observe is that uh, so there are strong papers are appearing uh, all over the year in different con conferences. And it's, it's a bit uh, shame that uh, the strong results are not at least presented here. So maybe there could be a, pr a kind of selection of uh, even if it's presented somewhere else, it's published somewhere else, uh, it won't be published again in the proceedings, but it will be presented uh, at the conference. That could strike under the interest. Uh, it's, it's not like, invi it's in between invited or, I, I don't know, it's uh, just, uh, invited speaker is more like kind of survey of something, whereas that would be devoted to a, a new result which is interested but has been published somewhere else. But it's really, meaningful for the community. No. Okay. okay, so there have been a couple of suggestions. One is to encourage more participation, there may be a different track of papers and presentations. Another, Christoph says, is maybe it's at the other end. We get the strong results and make the people present. So invited talks cover that to some extent. Um, school could be another place where you, know, you could have a, just like a two-day event where recent results kind of stuff, other papers. IPEC um, would be uh, to have uh, accompanying uh, workshops to, su to some specialized topic. Um, I don't know, it could be, um, it could be actually the, the worker workshop could be there. There could be a workshop on, I don't know, on experiments. Uh, maybe people uh, won't submit an, a purely experimental paper to IPEC, uh, but if there is a dedicated workshop on experiments, there might be such papers. So, um, so maybe that would work uh, for IPEC. I, I, I don't know. But for example, at the SAT conference, um, of course, it's a little bit a different flavor, which took place uh, uh, in Edinburgh as part of the IPEC, uh, the, sorry, the FLOC uh, conference. There we had several workshops, and and it worked quite well. So I don't know if that also works for uh, IPEC. And next year at Algo, there, there are already like five, six satellite conferences. This is a very big event. So it might be hard to add some more is workshops to it. Are the workshops um, kind of connected to a particular conference? To Algo. 
Yeah. Yeah, but then, then you have some hierarchy of conferences, right? So you have flock and conference and workshop. It, uh, sounds big, yeah. One of the reasons probably submission number is low is that we are just going and hitting every conference. So there are lots of conferences and there's multiple sessions on parameterized complexity in lots of other conferences. So. the second best paper. At least the second best paper should come here. Um, so do, do you know why people, you're saying there are some people who submit Isaac code. You want to add to this? I think the problem is with parameterized complexity that now there are something like 10, 12 groups in the world which generally produces papers and because somehow this it has become a group centric so if at the same time you have three four papers so somehow people try to you know move the papers to different places because they be, it's just a mental belief that you know if you do this way the probability that your paper will be accepted at different places is much higher because somehow in europe i have heard this argument quite often that in many conferences if you have three four papers and some of papers are on the borderline and if you already had two ex good accepted papers then your borderline paper might be rejected as to the other people so even these kind of things happens and as i told you there are some 12 to 14 groups which actually produce this paper so that could be also reason why the you know, numbers just go down It must be more than 12 to 14. <laughs> I mean, if you count them. It, it, I'm talking about in terms of groups, Mike, which like on very regular level, like they produce something like say 25 to 30, because when you talk about the group, they may have something like 20 people, 15, 20 people working in the same group on parameterized complexity. So by that, you will sum up. But as a group, somehow it's like a strategic decision that you don't want to kill his paper with your own paper of this. I mean, these things, you do things at a time. When like you are one author or two, three authors, you don't want to you know, compete against your papers at some time. I mean, at least, I, I think many of the time, I, mean, I have thought from that perspective that, OK, I should not be competing against my own papers or with my own authors. So. Maybe 
something like a, a theme specifically announced in the Kalpar papers. But the danger of that is that if you don't get So um, now the program committee next year will be a little bit smaller okay. than in the last years to to facilitate that. Yeah. So maybe it helps a little bit. Uh, I don't know. So then we get more papers. We'll see. They can submit. Yeah, but maybe when when the program committee is a bit smaller, then still you even if you are allowed to, maybe you don't feel so well when you submit. So. Yeah, I think so, yes. Every time you ask somebody to join the committee, you ask also, but by the way, I don't feel that. Large comments will make no more papers. Okay, yeah, for the record, uh, program committee <laughs> members may and should yeah. submit papers. Every program committee member and can and should. No, the. <laughs> The program committee chairs are not sub allowed to submit a paper, but there are only two. Uh, uh, I just want to ask this question since it's not clear to me. Is it uh, how is it much harder to find funding to travel to India? I mean, so is the distance to India a factor in this? Most of our groups are in Europe. I mean, it's not about money, maybe true in Europe, but I don't know about the U.S. I think Jainer, Jainer may have some. Uh, might uh, also be the date, right? This is just bef before the holidays. Some people might have other plans at this time. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, but in Victoria, it was just in May. So, <laughs> okay, Chennai. That may be a reason, but. Anyway, I think this is not the only forum to discuss this. You can continue to send mails and comments? Okay. No, not closing. I think it will be also nice to freeze the dates of, of IPEC. I mean, I think it should happen because it may be very hard to keep track of, you know, which like something like we follow like June, July for submission. Maybe we should just freeze at least dates. It may happen that, you know, like for example, if it happens in India, then it may happen in December. But at least date of submission, date of these things, that the or some of these things should be f frozen. Then that might also help, you know. Like, or in in my in, if you ask personally, even the dates of the conference, if it is 
say in September, they may be, it will just allow people to, you know, reorganize that, okay, there is in September, wherever it might be, you know, so at least, and like any other conference, they all have very, like more or less very similar dates, so this could just help. Yeah, I remember this was mentioned by Martin and Eric Demain last time also that you know, there are people who are work, you know, who are used to working with specific deadlines. They know if it's June, it's Isaac. If it's this, it's February, what, and so on. So, so it helps to have one date. Maybe, maybe that's something too. moving around at different places. But what Saki is saying is even if you move around, maybe we fix the submission date. Okay, so I think we'll close with that comment because as I said, we're not going to make all decisions here, and this is not the only forum for comments and feedback. You can send emails to any of the steering committee members, and we can continue to discuss this. So, thank you. So uh, just a quick announcement, yes, so there will be transportation back around 5.30 for those people who do not want to attend concert. There will also be a transportation back, 6 o'clock, okay. So there's a transportation at 6 o'clock for people to take you to Savera. There's also a transportation after the concert, so who those who want to stay back to attend concert, they can also go back later for the concert. So there are like transport both times, so it's, concert will be here around Around 6.30, yes, it's 6.30, so in an hour or so. So 